beekeeper at a factory is in charge of blowing the whistle for the lunch break at noon timekeeper at the factory when it's almost noon she looks at her watch and right when it strikes 12 p.m. she blows the whistle one day she bumps her watch against something and she fears it's a little off wanting to make sure that she can do her job correctly she decides to get her watch set by a professional clockmaker the woman goes to the shop and as the clock and has the clockmaker set her watch to the correct time she tells the clockmaker what she does for a living and that it is important that her watch keeps correct time the clockmaker tells her that she needn't worry because he set his watch by the clocks in the back and that he can be sure that they're on time because he sets them every Sunday when the church bells ring at 6 a.m. The woman leaves the shop satisfied but starts to ask herself, how does the church know exactly when it's 6 a.m.? So she goes to the church and finds the bell ringer and asks him how does he know when to ring the bells and how does he make sure that he has the correct time. The bell ringer tells her that he rings the bells right when his watch strikes 6 a.m. I'm sure my watch is accurate, he reassures her. I check it every day at noon when the factory goes on break. <laughs> I don't know if that's a true story. <laughs> Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Jesus is saying, this is, uh, this is uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a sermon on a mount. And he's saying here in, in 21 to 23 of 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Would you bow your heads? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for these precious morsels from your word and for the power that lies within. We pray that you'll guide this, these morsels to where you want them to go and they will have the effect that you want them to have in Jesus' name. Some people hope to get into heaven. Some people don't believe in existence after life. Some people think that they can gain eternal life by being a good person. Lots of people like that. I'm sure you know them personally. There are even people who know that they won't get into heaven and are okay with that. Or so they declare. Some philosophies believe that they will come back for another try. It's called reincarnation. The rats in a temple in India are thought to be former people. They feed the rats. They don't harm them. They don't try to get them out of there. They feed them. This verse in Matthew refers to people who think they are in God's good grace, but they are not. They are in fact bound for the flames of hell. Depart from me, he says, I never knew you. Jesus shows in these verses that a declaration of religion, no matter how spiritual, will not get us into heaven unless there's a true underlying conversion. Those pauses right there are for amens. <laughs> I still have my sign down here. If your conversation in prayer doesn't reveal the true depth within you, then God is not impressed with your words. The judgment of all mankind is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has the right to set the standards by which our lives are judged. Number one, it is not enough to say, Lord, Lord, without him really being our Lord. To address him as Lord must 
include that he owns us that we owe our very lives to him that we can't live without him or that we wouldn't want to if if we're just making a show of our profession of faith maybe the people are impressed that we talk to but God is not impressed just declaring that we are followers of Christ doesn't mean that we are and a lot of people claim to be Christian and use that word and they are not we can go to church sing the songs pray the prayers pay the tithes give to missions teach Sunday school and still not gain heaven all these things are good things there are things that we should be doing but going through the motions is works without faith faith in Jesus as Lord and Redeemer is how we are known to God personally intimately known to God second it is necessary to our salvation that we do the will of God his expressed will in the gospel is that we believe in him that we receive him John 1 12 that we live a holy life that we love one another and that we love outsiders enough to share the gospel with them and bring them in to the holy light of the truth of the gospel because they are in the dark if we call him Lord but don't comply with his will then we mock him and we are on dangerous ground I never knew you now that isn't something I'm addressing to anyone that's in here I know all of you Matthew 7 22 many will say to me on that day that day the day of judgment when everyone's soul is laid bare when the inner thoughts and motivations when the passions of everyone will be there for all to see thus the plea will come Lord Lord did we not prophesy in your name well Balaam prophesied and Saul was among the prophets but that didn't save them they made use of his name but he didn't send them a man or woman may be a preacher may be effective at it may bring others to Christ may pastor a large church and still be internally an unrepentant sinner just going through the motions we see them today abusers molesters adulterers pretending holiness but they are just as wicked as the world is continuing in verse 22 and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles a man might cast demons out of others and yet have a demon himself gifts of tongues prophecy healing and the like impress the world miracles in the supernatural are impressive to the world's sinners it draws attention but it is real holiness or sanctification that is accepted by God grace and love are more excellent way than moving mountains or speaking in tongues of men and angels should I say that one more time grace and love are more excellent way than moving mountains or speaking in tongues of men and angels first Corinthians 13 1 and 2 if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal verse 2 I if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love I am nothing 
So what does our love motivate us to do? Just love each other? We need to have love for the sinners. And we need to share the gospel with them. His conclusion in verse 23. He says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Very sad words to hear. Depart from me. And those words of condemnation are totally unnecessary. We all have opportunity to know God. Every person has the opportunity to reject the enticements of the world, to believe in the one who died to pay the penalties for their sins, to come to him in repentance and faith, to change our ways, to live in holiness, and to please God. Everyone has an opportunity to do that. Away from me, you evildoers. Perdition awaits for those who come to Christ with counterfeit claims. Didn't we do this and that in your name? I never knew you will be the condemning verdict. All of the works and wonders that they performed in his name will not save them. And that statement, I never knew you, Christ implies, number one, that he wanted to know you. He came to seek and save that which was lost. We're all lost until we're found. <laughs> lost in our sins. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Sin is the great separator. Knowing God is all about seeking God. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Half-hearted seeking won't do. A half-hearted relationship won't do. You can't have a half-hearted relationship with your husband or wife. It won't do. It won't last. Half-hearted. It's got to be all. you got to be all in. All the way in. I, I remember a pastor, let's see, that was three pastors ago. And he said, he said, he says, I can remember my wedding night. And uh, people are wondering what he's going to say. He says, I, he says, I was laying there. And he says, I looked over at her. And I thought, too late now. I'm in this. I'm all the way in. She, his wife never knew what he was going to say. But he, he, I'm in this. I'm in. All the way. And they have children that are pastors now. Beautiful people. David's example, Psalm 63 and verse 1, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being be longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. Herein is real, separa real desperation for God. Knowing him intimately is the only thing that satisfies that desperation. David already knew God. His desperation was to know him more. Know him more intensely. We sing that song, I want to know you more. To know him more completely. All through our walk with God, we should maintain the intense desire to know him more. More and more. Number two, he died to know you. Unless Jesus went to the cross, unless he allowed himself to be tortured, tormented, abused, and unless he spilled his blood on the ground, there was no way that we could gain eternity. He gave his life. He was the only one who could be the perfect lamb. He was the only one to ever live the perfect sinless life. His sacrifice on the cross was the only means by which you could know him and he know you. 
Number three, he warns that to know and be known of him is the only way to go to heaven. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's all about Jesus. It's not about how many mountains you have prayed into the sea. It's not about how much you spoke in tongues. It's not about how much you prophesied. It's not about how much you gave to the church. It's not about how much you gave to missions. It's not about how many people you led to the Lord. Those are all good things. Things we're expected to do. Things that will be jewels in your crown, but none of them gets you into heaven. It's Jesus that gets us into heaven. We can do all those things, but it's knowing him and his knowing you that counts. And then you won't hear, I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7 is the closing of the Sermon on the Mount. The warning is about true and false disciples. Jesus knew that there would be counterfeit disciples. He knew that they would be coming to him on that day. What he described as that day, claiming that they should be admitted because of works they had done in his name. But he would see through their counterfeit. Depart from me, I never knew you. I wonder about some of the televangelists today. It's not for me to judge. Jesus will do that. There's a telev televangelist whose entire ministry seems to be about people falling down. I never heard him lead anyone to the Lord. You see another one snapping heads back and knocking people down, snapping their heads back. There's nothing wrong with people falling under the power of God. I've had many people fall if I touch them, but I don't push them, I touch them, and I keep my hand right there. God doesn't need my help to knock somebody down. I don't push them. In the 70s, there was a couple going around. They're both dead now. They featured people in their meetings falling down. They preached miracles. They prayed for short legs. And that's a trick. It's a trick. I was there in three of their meetings. And there were people who got healed in spite of their antics. You don't need to do tricks to get people healed. You don't need to pretend that people have a short leg and you touch their leg and it seems to grow out, but you're actually moving it along with your hand. That's what they do. Some choose a church based on signs and wonders. Highly charged emotional worship, people falling down. I wish for more emotion, emotional worship. I like to see the Lord work in the services. I like to see healing. But that's God's business. We turn it over to Him. Choose a church. Not because of what people are doing. But where you can accomplish what God wants you to do. Churches like people go through seasons. The church, this church is in a season. We're a core looking to rebuild. But what are our motivations? Do we want the church to be like it used to be, except with more people in it? Is that what our desire is? Or do we need to find out what God's desire is and how this people, how this church is? Do we, do we need to find out how it can be the way he wants it to be? Do we want the church to prosper so that we can survive and pay the bills? Is that our motivation? So what, what do we want to do? 
Maybe a better question is, what does God want us to do? Change is not a thing that older people want. <laughs> we get comfortable. We sit in the same place. We say the same song. We sing the same songs. It's not something that we, that we like to do. We get comforted, and then we get comfort zone-itis. And, and that's harmful to a church. Because it means that we are keeping a church in the way that we like it to be. We have to let go of that and let the church be the way God wants it to be. In order for God to prosper in souls in the church. You watch on TV that prosperous churches don't look like a church. I don't know about you, but I think change is a good thing. When God leads us into something new and different, we should go with it. Oh, we're not comfortable with that. Guess what? I'm sure that you will agree with me that God's will trumps your comfort. <laughs> comfort zoneitis is harmful to a church. And Walt Smith told me that this shrinkage that's happening is happening all over everywhere he was a presbyter he's retired he lives in the potomac uh, retirement complex but he said this is happening all over and it's happening to churches that don't change we're closing more churches the ag when i say we the ag is closing more churches than they open So, here's the one thing I believe that God is impressing me to do for the next three weeks. Instead of Bible study, we'll have a prayer meeting. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Come out at 6.30 and we're going to pray. Just pray. Bob's going to open us with a song to bring us into an attitude of prayer. We're going to sit around. And we're not going to bring up needs and, and listen while I pray for them. I'll open. And then each person can bring up a need and pray for it. And we will all agree together for that need and that prayer. We'll all say, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And then we'll wait until somebody else is impressed to bring up another one. And we're just going to keep you be surprised what happens to an hour. You'll be amazed. But this is a new thing, at least since I've been here. John says they used to do that right here in the sanctuary, have prayer meetings like that. So that's a new thing. We need to do new things, because old things don't work. There's a new season in this church. So, you know, let's all get with it and do it. And I hope, you know, I hope and believe. I believe God's leading me to, to lead in that. And so I don't know. You know, the, as far as anything about God is he doesn't let us know what he's up to or what's going to happen next. We know how we'd like to see him work. And it's his business. So let's let's see how he's going to. Let's see how he's going to do it. Let's just turn it over to him. But let's spend some time in agreement prayer. We're all mature Christians. And if you sit around and, and don't have anything to bring up or nothing to speak, then just be in agreement. Just be in agreement. Agreement prayer. And I, I think God is leading me to lead in that particular way. Amen? Will you do it? <laughs> can I know you can't? Because you because you have to take care of your wife. I know. But at 6.30, just start praying. You'll be with us in spirit. <laughs> yeah. Would you stand?
to see the board for a few minutes. We have to decide what they what we're gonna have. Well, we thank you this morning. We lost our power and glory. Your presence in the house here this morning. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, and the Lord, Father, and we appreciate you. Without you, there's no purpose in our life or being. Without you, there's nothing. So we pray that you go with each other uh, and, and stay in a powerful way with us in uh, anticipation. The one thing we gather for prayer. Keep us all in your heart and the all things. Thank you. Hey, I need to see the board for a few minutes.